everyone, and welcome to the Pash On Podcast. Let's get started with your host, Brian Pash. Hi, this is Brian Pash, and welcome to another exciting podcast interview on today's show. We have the dynamic duo. We have Katie Kreider, the EVP of Media for Ansira, and Liz Nelligan. She's the Senior Director of Media And we're going to be talking about the media landscape today, the impact of the upcoming election cycle, and answering some of the challenges that dealers have today on how to place media most effectively. Katie and Liz, welcome to the show. Thank Thank you. you. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're uh, we're digging it. It's I I love doing a podcast because I don't have to worry about what my makeup looks like. So appreciate this. That's right. That's right. And, you know, I like it that way because I can talk to more people, especially those who say, well, I don't want to look bad, you know, on a on a, a, a video podcast. But I've seen some pretty gnarly video podcasts. So I guess people really don't care. Uh, we do, though. We care. We want consistency. And more importantly, a lot of the dealers listen to our podcast in their car. So it uh, works out perfectly. You know, uh, let's start at a very high level. There's been a lot of talk about changes in media buying based on states adding additional privacy regulations. We have the GLBA, uh, the Graham-Leach-Biley Act. Um, So we have data privacy concerns, uh, data transportation, you know, encrypted at rest, making sure you're not passing data to your agency in the clear. And then the wild, wild card is media buying in the upcoming election cycle. So let me start with you, Liz. When you think of the automotive landscape, um, and, and let's say 2024, what's one thing at a very high level that you want dealers to know about that can impact their overall media strategy? Yeah, you really hit the nail on the head with the word data. Data, privacy, that is definitely top of focus, um, just in the industry as a total. But I think it's important just to see how did we get here and what do we need to do going forward? So we definitely saw that over the last, gosh, 15 years, it's been the wow, wow west. We had media vendors who were collecting data with no rules except, hey, we're here to sell something. And now really in the digital media space, we're growing up. So we're having to handle those users and consumers in a much different perspective. And the key to this is really working together. We have those larger players in the game, that's the Googles, the Metas, the Amazons of the world that really created those walled gardens for us. But as media providers and as consumers and as sellers of inventory, we really have to work together so that we have the best ability for for everyone. And that's really the key part of that. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, a data driven media strategy has been talked about for a long time. But I think as the tools are evolving and, and my big challenge to dealers is can you control the cadence of the marketing and messaging that goes out to your customers and and most dealers say no i can't and uh we're going to talk about that today because uh creating the right media mix is one thing but creating the right frequency is also important katie let me throw out uh this question you know Dealers are spending more money now. Inventory levels are rising, depending on your brand. Rebates and incentives are back. So dealers have a time clock with a high floor planning, incentives, and an uncertain economy. They want to move that inventory as fast as possible. Buying is increasing. 2024 seems to be approaching a more normal Uh, inventory level year. How's the election generally impact media buying? And how could dealers start thinking about next year uh, in a proactive way that may benefit their spend or the alignment of their media? 
100%. Yeah. It's, it, you should be thinking about it now. So typically what we see happen, uh, there are types of media that have to offer equal time uh, from a rate and time standpoint. Um, so that obviously limits availability, especially as the prices tend to go up and get closer to the election date. So uh, those traditional, or we could call them linear media channels, are typically things like cable, radio, um, those types of things, broadcast. There are sponsorships that are not part of those kind of rules and regulations that you can go ahead and lock in on an annual basis. So you're not going to get bumped by, you know, a higher political, a higher cost political spot, which you often see happen. So I would encourage any annual sponsorships to be negotiated and locked in now as you're looking at 2024. You should be good to go. And obviously, um, whoever is is representing you, whether it's yourself or an agency or an inter- internal marketing person. You can just confirm that, that that is indeed the case with the sponsorship that you're buying. Uh, we have a ton of experience all in sponsorships that we negotiate for our hyper-local clients. Um, that's something that we're going through right now. Liz is, is elbow deep in those negotiations with the team. Uh, some of the other items, though, are things like OTT, um, premium audio. Those are programmatically placed. Uh, so while the, the we have seen CPMs go up in the past on things like social, uh, certainly on things like OTT, because you know we're in a live bidding environment in some cases, there is availability. So those are also items that you can loop into your plan. And just know that if you need more of that push media, so kind of reaching out to those that maybe aren't ready to buy a car today, but maybe in the next 30 or 60 days or 90 days, uh, you can add those programmatically placed, um, you know, spot um, opportunities to your strategy. And, And I think where it's really important, and Liz can talk, you know, more about this is when you're looking at sponsorships, experiential, and then how do I kind of fill the funnel with these other programmatically placed media channels, what does where's my audience spending their time and mm. and where can I prioritize my budget? So I think those are kind of the questions to start with and then go from there. But there's lots of options, but thinking about it now gives you the ability to lay in exactly what you're looking for. You know, uh, Liz, I want to ask you a question. You know, as I've been following the development of some of the offerings that the traditional cable companies, I guess we'd call the media companies now, Spectrum, Effective, Cox, uh, partnerships like BlockGraph, which are uh, data-driven clean room environments. What I think dealers are just beginning to understand that instead of saying, hey, I'm going to buy live sports and news, which was an old model, um, using data from their own website, who are the households visiting my website, modeling that audience, seeing what they're viewing to create a data-driven media strategy. And of course, once you understand that data and first-party data is becoming more important, then you have to partner with a media platform or a media buyer that supports a data-driven strategy. Can you talk a little bit about some of the breakthroughs of instead of, for example, just buying a Polk in-market shopper list or a a Google or Facebook in-market shopper list, how dealers could use visitors to their website or their group site to model actual in-market shoppers in their market in real time? Absolutely. Yes. Your data is so important. And that's really where you should be starting from knowing who your consumers are. And of course, many dealers know the demographics of their typical buyers, but people who are going to the website, there's so much more information that you can gather about them, their um, behaviors, their attributes, their psychographic details, What concerts are they visiting? What are they doing outside of work? Those types of things that you can really tailor your targeting to in order to reach that buyer wherever and whatever they're doing. Um, Definitely really good to, to take a look at that. The other piece of that is media consumption. So once you know who your target audience is, 
what are they doing online? What are they doing offline? What stores are they visiting? How can you additionally create more targeting segments outside of just that typical in-market buyer? Look at household incomes, look at some more of those um, behavioral or affinity details, interests, all of those things are very important. You know, one of the uh, trends that I'm seeing with the larger dealer groups that are investing in platforms like uh, CDPs, customer data platforms, as the dealer really comes to grips with a need to manage your first party data, and, and now that they have a place outside the CRM and DMS to unify their customer data, they can now for the first time append that psychographic, demographic, household uh, buying power data and and keep it. Um, you know, in the past, they would get a list, they would send it out to somebody, they would append, slice down the list, and then load it up to Google and Facebook, and all that data would be lost. I think what's really exciting to me is larger dealer groups are realizing if I maintain a central source of truth for my customers, if I partner with good data partners that add, well, insights to my data, I can control. Uh, my retention better, I can increase the lifetime value. Katie, you know, part of the ecosystem that Ansira delivers is not just automotive. Uh, you build loyalty, marketing, retention campaigns for some of the biggest retailers in the United States. Do you see that, you know, better first party data management yields uh, amazing results? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's all about how good is the data. And it doesn't matter if the source is Equifax. It doesn't matter if the source is your own CRM. It all starts with how good is the data, meaning we have large groups that do a really nice job of setting up segmentation within their data so we can mm -hmm. make sure that the the consumer has a very relevant experience. If you think of thousands of ads that you see every day, whether it be email, social, TV, radio, whatever the case may be, the more relevant they are to you, the more they're going to stand out. So the only way to do that when you have first party data is to get as segmented as humanly possible, right? So uh, we had a, a client come to us recently uh, that was really frustrated because their new customers were still receiving emails that said, um, you know, hey, if you haven't made a purchase yet, here's our most recent financing. <laughs> right. Well, these customers had already purchased a, a vehicle, but the, the client's CRM wasn't set up to funnel them into that category. No, we want them to get service ads. We want them to get you know, specials coming up. Hey, make sure that you're ready for winter. You know, your new vehicle is protected. You know, all those types of things. I said, well, look, we can get as, as custom as you'd like, but we have to have the appropriate data to power mm -hmm. it. Amen. But when you have that relevancy, that reaction increases 25%, 30%, in some cases, 50%, because you're speaking to someone with an action item that is actually relevant to them. So it's it's really not a difficult marketing concept. You just have to put the work in up front. Yeah. You know, Liz, I want to talk a little bit on, on this uh, current concerns about data privacy. I don't want to wish bad on anybody, but I think 2024, we're going to start seeing some lawsuits on data privacy, um, especially as, um, you know, lawyers and others who look for people with deep pockets, but it's very common for dealers today to work with an agency that says, hey, uh, dump out you know, your prospects in the CRM. We'll do a Facebook custom match or a Google match. Um, uh, export the people who are due for service or lap service, put that in a file, email me that. And this passing of unencrypted data and then that sits unencrypted on some agency server. They load it up into Google and Facebook. No one knows if those files are ever deleted. Um, just leaves everyone open for potential fines. Um, a future state as, as a benefit of better first-party data management or working with a company like Ansira that knows how to use data at scale is that uh, these audiences are not pump and dump. They're 
created real time as data is updated through a secure API connector into an email platform or meta platform or a Google platform. What's it going to take for people to really understand that's the way that we should be moving audiences from our business into marketing activation campaigns and not a flat file? Yeah, you should really be working with a partner, with an agency that has the ability to have those clean rooms. So you'll hear from our engineers and developers, I don't want your data. I don't want to know this. I want the PII. I want information that is not identifiable so that we can have those privacy regulations in place and yet still get that great information and granularity within that targeting. So it's really important to make sure that you have those encryptions as you're sharing that data with any partner there. Yeah. And and one of the things I just want to try to explain, it's it's a little hard to grasp until you've thought about it a few times. But for the dealers who are listening, let me explain. If you're managing your first party data uh, properly, there are, let's just say, a dozen use cases that we all can think of, like lapsed service customers or people who submit a lead who haven't purchased. Um, we can come up with these type of workflows. Uh, if you have a place where your data from your CRM and D DMS is being managed and updated on a daily basis, then these audiences of lap service people change when someone books a service appointment, they come out of that audience. Or if somebody who was in a kind of pursuit campaign because they submitted a lead when they buy a car, they should come out of the pursuit campaign. So I want the dealers to understand this. If you have audiences that are dynamically connected to Google, Facebook, uh, email, the, the agency only has to build the creative to support that audience, meaning they never see your list. They're just always knowing that you're going to be plugging in the audience for uh, lapsed service or the audience for pursuit or the audience for recall. And when dealers start to understand this, as, as you are mentioning, Liz, they need to find uh, agencies that are going to be able to work in an audience-based environment, not a list passing environment. And I think that's going to be a big shift over the next few years. Absolutely. Yes. And it is really, I think the word dynamic is clear and spot on to what that's going to change, where it's not just the lists. You see all the different kind of headers of what this person is, their first, last, email, address, all of that. It's really understanding from a larger perspective of those customers. Right. And, you know, Katie, since your role over media within the organization gives you kind of a bird's eye view of changes. You know, what's one thing you want dealers to know? Uh, maybe something old that's uh, new or popular again, or just another shift that you see that dealers would benefit from if they dug in and did a little bit more research. Yeah, that's, um, you know, it's funny. I just mentioned this this last week. I was at, um, I was at a panel with some other ad tech folks and I said, some of the greenest people in the industry are those working in media because there's only so many ways you can reach a person. We're really just recycling visual and audio ads in different formats, right? Depending on consumption. Uh, a lot of a lot of folks don't realize the mass premium audio consumption that's happening out there right now. Mm. It's in many cases, it's still very local. Uh, but it's happening on their phone or through an app in their car. So ads in audio are tremendously relevant. Uh, again, and we talked about this earlier, I mean, looking at audience consumption research first is critical, especially, you know, knowing hyper-local auto dealers only have so many dollars to spend, right? So you want to make sure it counts. But there should be a way, uh, whether you have local audio outlets that you can work with, that's great. But if you're if you're placing programmatic audio ads across multiple platforms, you know, there's like the big three, right? There's like Spotify, Pandora Sirius, and then Odyssey is as many others. I mean, iHeart has their own as well. You mentioned, um, you know, it, it's just 
you got to make sure that if the audience is consuming the media, don't wait until the research says, you know what, you should have been here last year, especially in a political climate, uh, like we mm. discussed earlier in the conversation. The other piece is out of home. So one of the things that, you know, really changed drastically in 2020 was obviously the amount of out of home exposure. However, we've seen that bounce back quite a bit. Folks are out and about. Again, you get a lot of that with like a local experiential opportunity, whether it be a sponsorship or a race or whatever the case may be. Uh, but simply digital billboards are tremendously consumed now uh, as much as they ever have been. And it gives you the ability to dynamically change your creative. You don't have to wait for, you know, cons- you know, um, a banner to be printed and and then installed right. and all of that. So uh, while the, it seems kind of crazy, like she's talking about, audio and she's talking about out of home and I've been talking about these things for 20 years. Yes. And they're still being consumed. You Mm. just have to address the way people are consuming them. You know, Kitty, you bring up a good point. Uh, Many, 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 many people I speak with uh, bring up their favorite podcasts. Yes. Uh, You know, obviously I think most people are like, what are you binge watching now? All right. That that has to be like a common, Hey, I'm done with, binge watching this series what's the next thing i should binge watch okay so um my wife and i are you know binge watching two series now um but i do hear people did you catch this podcast or this podcast or this podcast so honestly i don't know how many dealers are really doing targeted audio advertising so so for example how how would they go about saying, I want to be on some of the popular podcast uh, channels, uh, but I I want to target people in my market? Uh, it's it's contextual and, and zip code targeting at their absolute finest, I'll tell you. So you really can, you know restrict audio to a zip code or or a radius. Uh, All you need is access to either a DSP or a marketplace of some kind. And typically your agency would be able to do that for you. You know, and Sarah is able to do that. Um, We do that for many of our clients, some national clients that, that, you know, want a a national podcast play and some that want that hyper local approach. Again, look at the type of media that locally your customer is consuming is it news? Is it sports? What type of sports is it? And and we've had this conversation recently as well. Are you looking for people that are interested in, in EV? Well, there, there's EV podcasts that you can certainly, you know, restrict down to the zip code level. So all of that tech is out there and it's, they're actively inserting ads, you know, on a daily basis. So you don't, I remember 10 years ago, it was like, well, as soon as they download the podcast, that's the ad that they're going to get. Most of the time now, that is not the case. So you have Mm. that kind of real-time creative change that you're used to with other types of programmatically served media. So all you have to do is talk to your agency or Ansira or whoever is doing your programmatic, and they should have access to that tech. Well, you know, one of the things that's been popping up a lot lately, and and, uh, Liz or or Katie, either one uh, can respond to this, but I'm seeing more agencies talk about Amazon advertising. Uh, not just display ads, but actually, uh, you know, video advertising through programs on Amazon. Do we have any data, some performance, some KPIs, anything that would tell a dealer listening, hey, uh, Amazon as another outlet is really performing well? Yeah, I think we would be remiss to talk about the newest news in Amazon's world that just launched last week um, is the fact that Amazon Prime is now going to be offering ads. So Mm -hmm. typically in this space, that was not something that was ad supported. Those that have the Amazon Prime subscription um, don't necessarily see those. So that is all shifting for 2024, which is really exciting because Going back to our early, early conversations around just inventory in general, there's a scarcity of inventory. So the more opportunities that we can get that ad inventory in front of more eyeballs that fit that consumer and who our target audience is, the better off we'll be. So that's definitely something from 
the media world that we're keeping a very close eye on. Um, they're anticipating to reach 115 million households. Uh, the next highest is Hulu, which has 112 million. So there's definitely the scalability there. Mm. So some Love good that. data that we're keeping an eye on, definitely. Um, the other thing, and and I'm not a media expert. I'm like kind of in the weeds half the time uh, with the data. But, you know, Netflix also announced uh, advertising and I'm not sure where they are in their build out. I think on their last earnings call, people were asking them, uh, you know, at the speed at which they're going to ramp. What can you tell us uh, about the availability of uh, dealers to advertise on Netflix and and where are they in their ramp up of that uh, offering? Yeah, it's still a little unclear. I feel we hear one thing from them and then we hear another the next week. So we're trying to wrap our heads around it as well. When they first launched with their ad supported tier, um, there was very little inventory and it was right. very expensive. Yeah. So it was hard for any advertiser to get in there unless you were those large brands. Yeah, that that's and and I almost it was like they're having some scaling problems on their platform, their their ad serving platform. So it was interesting. It almost felt like, hey, they're trying to build this themselves where um, I think just recently, man, we, we have a lot of media stuff to talk about. Uh, I just saw that Twitter or, or X um, has partnered with Google to do some ad serving. Yeah, that's definitely something that is surprising in the market. It's kind of two larger players here. So just seeing how that's going to work. Um, I anticipate there's going to be some pushback, just some regulations, because usually when two large companies like that come together, there's always some hoops that they have to go through. So it'll, it'll be an interesting one to watch. Katie, when you think of... Mm, all the different dynamics in marketing a car dealership, you know, their news cars, used cars, service parts. We have the electrification concerns and range anxiety. There's a lot of topics that dealers could talk about as they push out their media strategy. Um, I think video streaming, uh, so non-clickable media has always been a challenge for dealers to try to understand, um, you know, traditional, not digital radio, uh, not a Pandora where there might be a, an ad click. What are you telling dealers who are trying to find the right media mix to reach their sales objectives on what type of KPIs or what type of attribution models would give them any signals that changes to their marketing mix is working. I know it's a broad <laughs> question. Yeah, it's a it's a fair one. It's it's a common one. So one of the things that that we always remind our clients, dealers, or or rooftops, or or what have you, is very few people, if any, are going to wake up in the morning and randomly decide that they're going to buy something from you. They have to have been told many times prior which means you have to find a way to address everyone that's in that cycle. So that's where Liz and I talk a lot about push and pull. And the idea being, if you're pushing a message out to those who maybe are ideally going to be your customer, but are just not ready to raise their hand yet and say, yes, I'm interested in this product, but they look a lot like your customer. They likely will be your customer, whether it be household income, whether it be other buying signals or other products that they already own, or they just purchased a home. And we know that after, you know, the majority of the time after you purchase a home, somehow you end up purchasing a vehicle as well. Um, if you constantly are filling that funnel at the top, it is a much quicker conversion at the bottom. So what we like to look at is much of the sales funnel or, or the customer journey is we can either see or control. And this kind of depends on how we're working with the dealer or, or who their other partners are. What was the lift in traffic? What was the lift in organic search terms? We have a whole um, organic media team that's able to do an analysis on, you know, what was the organic search lift based on when they started this campaign versus the three months prior and what were the different factors. So a lot of it, we're looking at what's their voice in the marketplace and how are people getting to their site? Because 
oftentimes, while paid search does take an awful lot of credit, and Google was brilliant for inventing it, by the way, let's invent an ad that people typically click on last because that means we're going to get a lot of credit. Um, there's a lot of things that happen prior to a paid search right. click. <laughs> exactly. And we look for triggers along the entire customer journey line for that reason. Um, you know, and a lot of that starts with an organic search or an organic visit um, or a visit to um, a social media page or a landing page. So we assess all of that and, and kind of value it equally, quite frankly, uh, as opposed to just putting the hyper value on the, you know, click an inventory item, click for more information or click to call. I want to throw a curve. I'm going to throw it at Liz. Liz, you ready for a curveball? I am. So uh, my niece is uh, an influencer. Mm -hmm. She uh, is making a lot of money uh, just um, showcasing fashion uh, products that are sent to her. I mean, her UPS driver, you know, must just pull up with a truck dedicated to her every day. Um, and she loves it. She's, she's literally working around the clock, just building her brand. And I'm so proud of her. Um, but more and more brands have been turning to influencers. Um, I haven't seen, uh, many dealers consider a local influencer or a regional influencer, uh, for vehicles, is is there anything that you're seeing as as trends that dealers should be thinking about? Because if the the major luxury brands are just stacked with influencers, new new cosmetics, uh, new jewelry, uh, it's influencer marketing, influencer marketing, influencer marketing is like on fire. What about for car dealers? Is is uh, is it applicable or is it a square peg in a round hole? Yes, definitely applicable. And also congratulations to your niece. I feel like I need to get her handle and maybe yeah. follow her. <laughs> yes, you will love her. She's, uh, she's, uh, so it's uh, her, her uh, Instagram is April Lockhart. So Perfect. just have to check April Lockhart out. Like that. Yes. In terms of auto and working with dealers, we have had ones that do work with the local influencers. And the key there is to really understanding your market. There are micro influencers who have less than 10,000 followers, which is really key for dealerships because their audiences trust that influencer. Anything that they say, they are going to take that into consideration and really into heart there. So there are strategies around partnering with the dealerships where you may offer them a vehicle for a week or two weeks and make sure that that influencer is posting about it and driving that traffic to in-store. All of that is, is really great details there. We already know that walk around videos have been very successful. So this is more of that UGC, that user generated content from an influencer that feels very much like a walk around video. So if you can capitalize on that and really work with a local influencer, it's going to be key in the market. You know, my friend uh, and colleague, Paul DeVries from Holland, he uh, recently acquired a micro car franchise, a, a French uh, brand. And, and these micro cars are uh, two seaters uh, designed for city driving. Uh, and they're really cute. Um, and he hired a local influencer. Uh, I would say a micro influencer uh, and gave her a car for the year. And her kind of thing was, you know, video her in the car and traveling right because she's already moving from one place to another and he was amazed at how car sales picked up because young uh people don't need to spend a lot of money in a car it's a kind of a city environment and i was like man uh you know i i gotta figure out how dealers find some of these micro influencers because it seems to be a trend that's working, you know, not only firsthand in our family, but now uh, even my colleague uh, across the pond. Yeah, absolutely. And there are, again, going back to data, there's so much data around that. You can even see what's the engagement rate with 
specific influencers. You can have your agency negotiate on your behalf. So it's a really strategic move, but it's definitely key to partner with someone that can manage that for you. Got it. Katie, uh, as we get ready to wrap up our interview, I think we've given dealers a lot to think about, especially about new opportunities, whether it's Netflix or Amazon, whether it's influencers, um, working with a media buying platform that has reach and scale and making sure that data is moving from CRM and DMS securely to agencies with a clear audit trail, what's one thing that you'd like dealers to walk away from today um, that really puts a cherry on our conversation about 2024 media buying strategies for their dealership? I would say plan for your ideal customer journey. Really think about what that customer journey is. And everybody, you know, said, the dealers often say like, look, we we want people to get to the inventory pages and we want them to buy a car from us. Great. Why? Why are they going to keep asking why? Why are they going to buy a car from you? What are they going to learn about you that makes them want to buy a car from you? Start tracking those things. Is it reviews? Is it customer service pages? Is it that you have an incredible service team and you want to track that individual service, you know, customer journey? Is it that you really want to wrap your arms around a local charity or a local event and create a brand around that. Uh, and I th and then planning the the appropriate media from there, I think is, is really the key to success and efficiency. Um, because if you don't really know what you want the consumer to do, it's really hard to plan for the appropriate media mix. Mm. You know, and you, and you hit something that immediately made me think about EVs. There are some manufacturers that have produced some EV models that are sitting on dealer lots. And and you you hit it right on the head. Hey, Brian, uh, man, it's really hard selling these models. Okay, I would respond, if you want to sell these models, what are you sharing with consumers about range anxiety, about charging infrastructure, about total cost of ownership, about current incentives, um, about hey, leasing is probably the best strategy because you're making a minimum commitment in case technology changes. I just want to encourage the dealers listening. As Katie said, hey, when you have a business challenge, you need to ask yourself, why would they come to me? And if you're playing the long game, they're going to come to you because you made them feel comfortable that buying an EV wouldn't be, uh, you know, bleeding edge. You've made them comfortable that leasing can lock in a $7,500 government rebate. You've made it comfortable that your service department is not going to overcharge them. Whatever those business challenges are, think about how your media strategy is addressing some of those headwinds. Uh, Liz, same thing for you. If you had to just cap our discussion today about 2024 media buying strategies. What's one thing you want to remind dealers about as they look toward the year ahead? Yeah. The biggest thing for me that I want to get across is Start with data and use your own data. Help that to define the goals of what you're seeing for your business. So then really kind of taking that in, in, in consideration for what Katie and you had discussed as well. Well, I am so pleased that we sat down because you got my mind thinking about what I need to help uh, dealers with visualize for the year ahead. Um, this podcast interview is part of a series leading up to the Modern Retailing Conference. And just as you heard from Katie and Liz, um, they have the modern marketing strategies that dealers need to match a modern retailing strategy. So if you haven't purchased your tickets to attend MRC, we'll go to modernretailingconference.com. The team of uh, uh, and Sierra will be there. They are deep supporters of dealer education. And every time they're there, they're bringing insights from the many facets of their organization that you're not going to want to miss. 
And if this is the first time you're listening to one of my podcast interviews, you should know there are dozens of interviews online with uh, industry leaders, uh, technology developers, and dealers who are solving problems in automotive retail. Just search the Brian Pash podcast wherever you listen to your podcast channel. Uh, Katie, Liz, I know you're going to be in Palm Beach for the Modern Retailing Conference. Are you ready to get a little warm weather in November to kind of brighten up the chilly fall air? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Emphatically, yes. Right. Well, everyone loves the O Hotel and Resort. So please uh, trust me for the dealers who are listening. Book your hotel rooms now. We sell out the conference every year. Uh, Katie Liz, thanks for supporting dealer education. Thanks for sharing your insights. And for everyone who's listening today, thanks for trusting us with your time. I hope you can apply some of these media buying strategies and planning strategies for the year ahead to help you sell more cars in a digital age. Thank you for listening, and I'll catch you next time on another podcast interview.